I read about an experiment amongst a group of friends living in New York City. They did not grow up there. They were new to city life and wanted to experience everything that was offered. So this last minute idea, which continued, where they would get together with a small group of friends and pick an area of the city without any specific plans in mind, and then they would decide what to do that day. That it was never more than a small group, never more than a number of people that would fit around a table at a meal. And then they took turns, everyone getting to decide what they would do on that given day. And they ended up seeing all of the major attractions we might assume someone would want to see in New York City, but they also had a list of experiences that you would never find in any travel handbook for tourists to do. For example, they met the owner of a restaurant and in striking up a conversation, this owner invited them to his apartment upstairs just above the restaurant to see this rare flower that his grandmother had given him years ago that only bloomed one night a year. And then on another afternoon, they spent several hours hanging out with a local news TV crew just standing there on the curb as they awaited to break a story, but listen to them talk about the range of experiences that they had had in their line of work. And then on another day, they ended up sitting down and having an in-depth conversation with a rabbi from an Orthodox synagogue asking questions about all matters of faith. Well, this last minute idea developed into what Priya Parker called I am here days. As in, I am here for this experience. And over time, they developed these formal guidelines for the I am here days. That first, you had to spend the entire day together. Nobody could leave early. Two, no technology was allowed. You had to leave your phone at home. Three, you had to participate in all the experiences, open and willing. And fourth, at the meal, there can only be one conversation topic. Everybody had to talk about the same thing. Now, normally, we associate rules with strict limitations. But in this case, the rules were liberating. That every single rule for the I am here days emphasized the fact that when you are here, You cannot be there. That you have to be present in the moment. That you can only be at one place at one time. And as Parker writes, in a world full of infinite choices, Choosing one thing is a revolutionary act. And in the second letter to the Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is inviting the people to one thing. In a city like Thessalonica that is full of many things, that there is so much going on in this city, it is full of commerce and trade. There are major roads and extensive trade routes. It's a port city connecting key regions of the world, people from all over. 
It's one of the reasons Paul went there to share the good news that Paul preached in the synagogue. He cultivated Christian communities. But then he angered enough people, he had to flee the city for the safety of his life. But he returns on the second missionary journey because the churches there need his support that Paul witnessed watching them when there is so much to deal with. Sometimes our response is to do nothing at all. (laughs) That it's just too overwhelming. It just seems futile. So Paul invites them to refrain from idleness. That in a world of many things, we are to choose one thing. And in a similar way, Jesus invites the disciples to choose one thing that he calls them to choose the steadfast love of God, which seems simple on the surface. But it means that the disciples had to let go of other things. And this got Jesus into trouble. That as they were walking along, Jesus and the disciples overheard someone talking about the beauty of the temple. And Jesus said, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And this caused a panic. It got Jesus into real trouble. In fact, The Gospel of John recognizes how this is such a tipping point. And it's why the Gospel puts this story at the beginning of John. Even though it is found much later in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But by the time the Gospel of John was written, it was evident how much trouble this got Jesus into. So he emphasizes it by putting it at the beginning, it calls us to one thing, to what we find in the foundation of the temple. Because if the temple is destroyed, only the foundation remains. And the foundation is the solidarity and grace of the steadfast love of God, that that is the one thing, which of course is easier said than done, that we are pulled in so many different directions, but there is one thing that can help us sort through them all. It's not just one thing that we must do. It's one thing that helps us understand the many things or how to do the many things. It's like the practice of fasting which has long been an important tradition in the history of the church. It is one way that people have focused on God as they have reflected on God's presence in their lives. But as important as that is, there were times when people needed to break their fast, to set it aside because something more important came along that it is said, If your neighbor came knocking on your door and needed something to eat, that you were to break your fast. That your neighbor was more important. 
because of that one thing. That the one thing can give us clarity and direction, even in a world that feels like it is constantly changing around us. One author who grew up in the flat plains of Texas says that that area of the world is as flat as a pancake and the roads are as straight as an arrow, so much so that you can safely drive down them by simply looking in your rearview mirror. Because the road in front of you is exactly the same as the road behind you. That all you have to do is look in your rearview mirror and keep your car between the white lines. But what happens when you're looking in the rearview mirror and the road begins to curve in front of you. Perhaps all of us would like the world not to change. But unfortunately, life does not allow that to happen. But the good news is, there is one thing which does not change, but it helps us to change. That we can focus on the solidarity and grace of the steadfast love of God, which leads us forward, even if it is in a way that is different from our past. It's why the Apostle Paul says, simply do the next right thing in front of you. That there is one thing that can help us decide the next right thing in front of us. Growing up, one of my favorite times at church camp became what we called morning watch. That the counselors would wake, up, uh, wake us up in the morning. That was not my favorite part. And we'd venture down to the edge of the lake where we would hear someone give a morning devotion. And it was not so much about what the person said in the morning devotion. It was standing there in this, this moment of the morning where the water was as flat and as calm as could be and the air was still. It was like everything was quiet enough that you could hear the morning say, Today is a new day. That I did not know that morning watch is a nautical term. It names that early morning shift from like 4 to 8 a.m. and thankfully they didn't wake us up that early. Where you would stand watch over the ship. But those are the hours when the sun would rise and the morning would greet you, where everything is calm enough and still enough to hear God whisper, today is a new day. Everything is brand new. That every day the morning says to us, we can begin again by focusing on one thing, by stepping into the present moment. And no matter what we face, what burden we are carrying around, no matter what worries us or scares us, that we can hold on to that one thing 
and simply do the next right thing in front of us. Amen.